Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Digital Integrated Circuits. I'm Professor Adam Thiemann of the Annex Labs at Bar Ilan University, and today we'll be going over the Kahoot for Lecture 11, Other Memories. In this Kahoot, we'll have 11 questions, and the first is, what memory classification does DRAM belong to? Non-volatile memory, serial access memory, read-write memory, or content addressable memory? And the answer, of course, is read-write memory. So going back to this memory classification, we see that all memory arrays can be divided in several different ways. And the ones that we showed over here, where on the left side we have random access memories, in the middle we have serial access memories, and on the right side we have content addressable memories. Well, we're not going to be discussing serial access or content addressable memories in this course, maybe in a future um, lesson or something I will discuss it. Um, for random access memories, traditionally we divide it into two sides. One is read-write memory, the other is read-only memory. Um, the differentiation here may not be as clear-cut as it was originally, but this is how we um, usually categorize it. So when we talk about RAM, which is read-write memory, and again, this is a random access memory, which means that we can access any word or byte or bit, depending on the exact configuration, but randomly we don't have to um, access it in a certain type of an order, such as serial access memories, or according to uh, looking, searching for the data, such as in camps. So in random access memories, we can go random at anything, and usually when we say RAM, we don't mean uh, the guys over here, we actually mean the guys over here, which I'm calling in this classification read and write memories because they are readable and writable. And another thing that features them is that they are volatile, which means that once you turn off the power, unplug the computer or um, remove the battery or the battery runs out, we will lose the data. And the two types of those are static RAM, which we discussed in depth, and dynamic RAM, which we discussed in this, uh, in this lecture. On the other side, we have the read-only memories, where under read-only memories, we have the traditional you know, mask ROM, which is really a read-only memory that is set forever, or a programmable ROM, which will like blow out a fuse or something to program it. Um, but then we have the other side, which are actually writable, which are the EEPROM, EEPROM, and flash ROM, and um, the other emerging devices that we started to discuss at the end of this lesson. And they are writable, but um, traditionally they're um, replacements for these ROMs, and so we call them um, read-only memories, or um, actually, these are actually called NVMs, uh, I would say, as non-volatile memories. They are non-volatile, but they are writable. Usually, they are um, better to be read than write in, in terms of endurance, in terms of speed, in terms of power, and so they're still considered a, a, under the classification of ROM. Um, anyway, when we were asking about DRAM, the classification DRAM and SRAM are read-write memories. Question number two. Which of the following is an embedded on-chip memory? SRAM, DRAM, flash, or HDD, standing for hard disk drive? SRAM, of course. So we saw in the lecture that we have this memory hierarchy of a personal computer. At the top, we have our computational unit, let's say the CPU or another computational unit that uses registers that are in the data path and their sub-cycle latency to access them. Those are flip-flops, and of course, they're embedded. They're just standard CMOS logic gates. Um, Below that, though, we have the uh, the caches or scratch pad memories that are on chip, and these are the embedded memories. So these guys are really what we would consider embedded, okay? Um, so they're the on-chip memories, and the vast majority of them are made out of SRAM. We also have things such as EDRAM, and actually some of the NVMs that we discussed are um, considered to be embedded in some ways, uh, depending on how we make them and what their technology is. But in general, the embedded memories are um, mainly uh, primarily SRAM up till today. When Once we want to go to DRAM, we need a special fab to make the deep trench capacitors or the stack capacitors, and therefore we can't make them in the same process as we make the um, logic. And, and therefore we um, provide our DRAMs as an external chip um, on usually what we call a DIM, a dual inline uh, memory module, and that's going to be already off chip. So this is going to be already off chip. Of course, when we talk about um, secondary storage, which can be hard disks, it can be flash, it can be other things that are going to be separate chips in a separate type of a way that we make them. I mean, hard disks are going to be these magnetic disks and so forth. That is going to be, of course, off-chip and not an embedded type of a memory.
So the answer to our question was SRAM, as DRAM, flash, and of course hard disks, they are um, created in a separate type of a, of a, of a fab, uh, HDD, of course, as a standard HDD and not as a, um, uh, as a solid state drive will be something completely different, not in a VLSI process. Question number three, what is stored in address 11? So this is what we have here, the, as we saw in the lecture, and we have word zero, word one, word two, word three, and we have the different connections of the transistors over here. So we have different options, zero one, zero one, zero one, zero one, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, or one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. And in this case, our option that is gonna be stored at address one, one is going to be one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. Now let's go and discuss how we figured that out. So this is the picture we had over here. And this is just a four word, six bit NOR type ROM. And remember about NOR. So we had um, for like a pseudo NMOS NOR or something like that, or a dynamic type of a NOR, we had some sort of a pull up device. And then we had NMOS pull down devices that were connected in parallel. Um, and you just had to, you know, uh, um, turn on one of these pull down devices in order to get a zero at the output. So it was enough to have, you know, a, a one over here to pull down the output. And that provided a NOR uh, functionality between, you know, these four inputs, which were connected to the pull down devices. And the same is uh, done over here. So we have our word line, you know, that is going to um, uh, turn on whichever bit we have over here, we're going to have our, um, our source line or bit line or, or whatever you want to call it over here that has one of these pull-up devices. So that's going to be similar to this guy. And if we have a transistor here or not that is connected to ground, so we're going to have our ground lines, as you can see over here, that means that we get this conditional discharge. Um, the way we differentiate between a one and a zero is by putting a transistor there or not putting a transistor there. So let's take uh, the first word line over here that comes out of our decoder. So when we have a one, a zero equals zero, zero, what we're going to do is we're going to turn this word line on. So word line zero, which is going to correspond to address zero, zero is going to turn on. And if we look at the first bit line, um, what is going to happen? All of these guys are going to be off. So we're going to have one zero 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 over here to um, decode the zero, zero input. And in this case, you know, um, all of these are going to be zero. So this is going to be cut off and this is going to be cut off. And in this case, the pull up is going to pull this up to VDD. And there is nothing here to discharge it because there's no connection over here pulling it down. So our output uh, or the, the level of this line is going to be VDD. In this case, there is an inverter over here. And therefore, we're going to get a zero at the output. If we go to the second bit line over here, which is going to be, you know, MSB minus one or bit number um, four in this case. So there's going to be five, four, three, two, one zero um, and bit number four we're going to have the opposite occur so this is again going to be pulled up to vdd um, there's going to be zero 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 here so this is going to be off this is going to be off this is going to be off so this transistor is going to be cut off okay but this is going to be um, uh, pulled up right to vdd and therefore there's going to be a path that's going to go through here down to ground that's a path similar to this one and it's going to discharge this vdd down to zero so we're going to get the zero over here it's going to go over an inversion and bring us a one so what we can see here is along this word line wherever we have a transistor we get a one and wherever wherever we don't have a transistor such as here here and here we get a zero and therefore for um word number zero uh, at address zero zero what we're going to have here is a zero one zero one zero one and we can show that with a dot diagram over here wherever we have these dots it means there is a transistor versus wherever we don't there is not a transistor and in this configuration that represents a one so we're going to have zero one zero one zero one okay and the the question was about word number three which is one one of course so that's going to be when we have zero 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 one over here turning on word number three and in this case wherever we have a transistor we're going to have a one which corresponds to this dot diagram which means one zero one zero one zero um, and that is the answer to our Kahoot. so of course if we asked about the norom let's ask about the nand rom over here so what data is stored at address zero one so is it going to be zero 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 one zero one one zero zero one or zero one zero zero and i'll let you look at that for a moment
And of course, the answer is going to be 1001. So let's go back and see how we uh, analyze this NAND round. So in this case, we have a four word, four bit NAND round. So we're going to have four words over here from 0001, 1011. And what we asked about was um, word number uh, 01. Okay. And uh, again, we're going to have this pull up device over here. But in this case, we're going to have serial connection of, of uh, NMOSes. So again, we have this pull up device over here that is pulling us up to a weak VDD. Um, but then we have a, a line of these NMOS pull down devices which conditionally they are going to pull down the, uh, the output to zero if we have everything is a one. So only in the case where we have one, 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 are we going to get this pull down. Um, and in this case, what we're going to do is um, we're going to actually turn on all of the, the rows except for the selected row. So if we're selecting row number two over here, this one is the one we're going to turn off. If there is a transistor there, it's going to cut off this path, and we're going to uh, have VDD at our pull-up over here. If there, is, if there is no transistor here, that's just going to be a short circuit, and then this pull-down is going to be enabled. So let's take, again, word number zero and look at what happens here. So again, this pull-up device is going to make this weak VDD up here, and we're going to conditionally see if we pull down the bit line over here. So what we're going to do now is we're going to put all of the non-selected lines at one, and only the selected line drop it down to zero it drops down to zero nothing happens over here it doesn't really matter but this of course is on here uh, this is also on it doesn't really matter and this is also on so we get this full connection from uh, from uh, uh, the output to ground and that's going to pull down our output and provide us with a zero over here Okay, if on the other hand there was a one, such as in this case, now we have a zero over here, which is going to cut off this device. Here and this and this, they're all on, right? This one had a one over here, so it is on. Um, so this is going to be able to pull down, but since there is this cutoff transistor over here, it's going to block the output, and we're going to retain our pre-charge or our, our, our weak pull-up VDD over here. So basically, if there is a transistor there, it gives us a VDD at the output, and since this is the output, that's going to be a 1. So similar to uh, what we showed in the NORAM, just without the inversion, uh, this time we're going to get, for the, trans the places where there are transistors, we're going to get a 1 um, because we are going to stop the pull-down of the output. So we're going to have, in, in this line, we're going to have 0, 1, 0, 0. And again, we can show that in our dot diagram, wherever there is a transistor, we're going to have a 1, and we get 0, 1, 0, 0 on the first line. Um, in our question, we asked about word line number 1, I believe. And so, um, again, we have a transistor here, a transistor there. We don't have a transistor here or here, which provides us with a 1, 0, 0, 1. So let's go back to our question. And yes, the address at 0, 1 was 1, 0, 0, 1. So question number 5. Which of the following is an advantage of NANDROM over NORROM? Is NANDROM faster than NORROM for read? Is it faster for write? Does it have smaller area or does it have lower power? And since we don't have in all of the above, only one of these correct and the correct one is a smaller area. So the, the concept of NOR and NAND is very important because many memory structures are built in this NOR and NAND type of a layout. So this is MASK-ROM, and MASK-ROM is um, less commonly used today and so forth, but it, this uh, shows us how um, NOR and NAND flash are laid out and other types of, 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 opera, of technologies. So when we take the, the NOR example, which we saw here before, and what we're doing here again is we're providing this common ground line within each, uh, between each cell because we have to have this connection to ground between each of these cells. Um, so this connection requires us to have these, uh, these uh, uh, contacts, and we get this contact-dominated type of a layout. The way that we're actually going to um, differentiate between a, um, a junction over here where there is no transistor and a junction that there is a transistor is by adding or not adding a contact over here. So we have one mask, the mask that makes the same contact as this one, and we can decide if it has a contact or not and thereby program the NOR flash. Um, we can go and re-spin this, uh, have a metal fix type of a tape out. In other words, just tape out with the same mask set, which costs a lot, just change that one single mask that makes our contact and we can reprogram this um, this cell to either have a contact there or not and therefore differentiate between a 0 and 1. However, the problem is that this contact-dominated layout makes our cell size quite large 
and in the terminology of lambdas, where lambda is half the minimum pitch, we get 11 lambda by 7 lambda for this type of a cell, which is quite large. Okay, so that's going to be a 77 lambda squared. Um, on the other hand, uh, when we take a NAND flash, what we see here is that we don't have a uh, connection between each transistor and ground. We actually just have abutment between every uh, pair of transistors, such as here. Okay, so we can share this diffusion, as you can see on this thing. We just have one straight line of diffusion that connects between every two transistors, and we only need one contact to, you know, ground and to uh, at the end of the at the end of the line. This causes us to have a much larger um, resistance for pulling down the, uh, the 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 bit line, but it makes us save a lot of area in in the in the cell, and we can get this to be very small. The way that we actually differentiate between where we create a transistor such as here or don't create a transistor such as here is through a threshold altering implant so we have a mask that goes and makes this type of a transistor a depletion mode transistor which means it's always on and therefore it basically cancels out the transistor even when we have zero in the bit line it will still be um, uh, it will still be um, uh, uh, conducting okay and that enables us to get this really small cell size in this case 5 lambda by 6 lambda which is 30 lambda square and we see that that is you know less than half the size of the NAND cell in fact as we discussed later on in the discussion we can have something like a 4f square in uh, modern terminology of this stuff thing for um, this NAND type of a layout and that's why really NAND has become the dominant structure because even though it has slower reads it has such a, an area benefit that that's really the common thing that is used in most cases. So question number six, which of the following is not a characteristic of the one transistor, one capacitor DRAM cell? And here we can see a DIM of DRAM that has these 1T, 1C cells all over. Okay, is a, is a uh, characteristic charge sharing? Is it decoupled reads? Is it destructive reads or is it single-ended readout? Which of them is not a characteristic? So three of them are characteristics and one of them is not. And the one that is not is, of course, decoupled reads. So let's go back to our um, 1T, 1C smell, uh, cell. And uh, Denard, the same guy who made Denard's Law, Robert Denard, um, probably the thing that he is most well known for is his invention of the 1T, 1C DRAM cell that was... Uh, he patented at IBM in 1967. And what we have over here is this cell that has, you know, the same word line and bit line crossbar type of a structure where we only have a single cell that is both the read and write access port. So when we want to write to the cell, we turn on the word line over here. And depending on the if the bit line is at VDD or at ground, we pass a level over to the, um, the capacitance over here. So that can be either zero or it can be something like VDD minus VT, unless we overdrive the word line to be something like VDD plus VT, and then we can get a higher level here. Okay, then during read, what we do is we pre-charge the bit line to VDD over two. We again um, apply a pulse to the, uh, the transistor over here, and then we have charge sharing. If we are at zero over here, what is gonna happen is that some charge is gonna run over and uh, fill up the capacitor. This is a smaller capacitor than this large um, CBL capacitor, this bit line capacitor, and therefore it's going to charge quickly up to that VDD um, over two level, um, but it's this is going to lose charge. So this is going to lose a bit, so it's gonna be at a minus delta, so this is gonna stop charging at VDD over two minus delta. On the other hand, if we have VDD minus VT, this is going to, again, uh, what we're going to have over here is that um, this is a higher, uh, a higher potential, so charge is going to run through and fill up the CBL capacitor, but since it's much smaller, what's going to happen, it's only going to change it by some sort of a delta, and this will actually go down into VDD minus VT, uh, I mean, excuse me, VDD over 2 plus delta. So there is a difference when we read out between the, if there was a, a 0 or a 1 stored in the cell, um, by the fact that we're going to get the bit line is going to be either it's VDD over 2 minus delta or VDD over 2 plus delta, and our sense amplifier has to be very, very sensitive to, um, to lock that in. Okay, um, what this does also is that our final state is going to be the fact that both of these are around VDD over 2, so we cannot differentiate anymore if there was a 0 or 1 over here. So that is called destructive read, and it requires a write-back operation to write back the data into the cell. 
Um, actually, the way it's usually done on these types of dims is that we read out our cell, we store it in some sort of a row buffer, and we, when we want to um, open up a different row, then we do what's called a precharge, which is actually writing back the data that is stored in the in the row buffer to the cell. That way, we can read and write directly from the row buffer, um, and not every time have to go and access the DRAM, which is much slower and uh, has to differentiate between these small levels over here. Okay, so. Um, uh, another thing is with the charge sharing that it's very dependent as we can see here that this little delta v is v bit minus v pre precharge times c uh, s divided by c s plus c b l that's kind of a uh, a nice little um uh, uh an analytical expression that tells you what the delta v is going to be over here and it really is dependent on this ratio between c s and c b l to make this delta be substantial we have to have c s quite large because c b l is going to be very large and therefore we need to have these special types of fabs that can make very very, very large capacitors in order to ensure that we can read this out correctly. Um, so that is uh, that is the uh, the one T one C cell. I just want to mention that um, the read and write are through the same transistor, so they are not what we would call decoupled. They are very coupled to each other. If we make this transistor larger, you know, it's going to affect both read and write or slower, etc. Okay, so um, when we go back to our Kahoot over here, this is based on charge sharing, and as we saw, the read is destructive. Another thing is that the, the readout is through the same single bit line um, as opposed to SRAM, which is differential through two bit lines, and then we have to provide a sense amplifier that can really, uh, or, or, a, or a readout mechanism that can um, work with uh, such a single-ended readout. Sometimes it is done with a, uh, a, a replica type of a cell that will read out from a different part of the array and compare the two of them. Um, decoupled read is, as we said, not one of the characteristics of this cell. So question number seven. What is the following symbol? Is this an FDSOI NMOS cell? Let me put this little line in the middle, right? Is it a thick oxide IO NMOS? Is it a depletion mode, or what we may call a native NMOS? Or is it a floating gate NMOS? And the answer is going to be, of course, the floating gate NMOS. So let's remember what the floating gate transistor is, because this is really what enabled us to have flash and have our SSDs and our USB uh, flash drives and so forth that we have today and that we're, we're very reliant on. So this is an invention by um, this guy over here, whose name is Dov Froman, who was an Israeli um, engineer at Intel in the early days. Um, he finished, I believe, his uh, PhD at Stanford and was a postdoc over there, started working for Intel and came up with this idea, which Gordon Moore said, is in it as important a development uh, of the microcomputer industry as the microprocessor itself. Um, thanks to him, actually, Intel came to Israel, and it's one of the biggest companies that has driven the high-tech industry um, in Israel for the last, uh, what could be now, 40 years, I guess. So this is the floating gate transistor that um, Dov Froman invented, and the idea is that it's a regular MOSFET, but we take our oxide over here, our gate oxide, and we stick another piece of, uh, of um, conductive material, of uh, polysilicon, in the middle. And that causes the fact that we have, you know, this lower level oxide barrier and a higher level oxide barrier. And that's why we draw it like this with this little um, line in the middle. And what happens here is that we have a potential barrier between, you know, the channel over here and the first, uh, uh, the first layer and the, and the first layer and the second layer. And if we apply a high enough um, uh, voltage on the gate over here, that voltage is going to come and, uh, uh, you know, apply to the channel underneath here. And if it's high enough, it's going to pull, you know, an electron uh, that is going to be stuck, uh, that's going to jump over this thing and get into our, um, our floating gate. And it's going to come over here. And then the, uh, at some point or some of them, what we'll have is a smaller, um, a, a smaller, uh, field over the second one so it won't jump over again. And once we get enough of this charge to stick here, actually, these um, field, uh, these field uh, um, lines get smaller, and then they will stop 
jumping up here and it, it kind of gets stuck at a certain type uh, amount of charge uh, pretty much that is inside this red area and that is basically sets the vt of our transistor so um, then if uh, for the original eprom to get rid of that we had to take this device and stick it in some ultra uh, violet light which would basically remove all the charge from out over here but you couldn't do it inside your computer um, the follow-up to that is the electrically programmable uh, the electrically erasable programmable ROM, or the EEPROM, which enabled us to do that um, usually in something like Fowler-Nordheim tunneling without actually going, taking our device outside of the, um, the, the device, but rather by pulling the uh, charge the other way. So, and that is how basically flash works today. Okay, so that is the floating gate transistor, and it's really the workhorse of what we've been using for our, um, uh, our non-volatile memories for the last... Uh, 30 to 40 years. Okay, so um, that is a floating gate NMOS. All the rest were just, uh, you know, not true. Question number eight. How is a flash cell programmed? By changing the VT of the transistor, by exposing it to ultraviolet light, by flashing a quick pulse of current on its gate through avalanche breakdown of a reverse bias diode. And I'm going to give the answer to be the first one over here by changing the VT of the transistor. And when we talk about a, um, uh, a flash device or a floating gate device or many of the NVMs, actually, the different resistive devices and so forth, what we're actually doing, or one way of looking at it at least, is programming the threshold. So this is a programmable threshold transistor. And we often look at a graph that looks something like this, which shows the difference between our zero state and our one state. What do we actually have here? We have our traditional um, graph that we've been looking at for a long time, which is our VGS to ID graph which we know is this type of a thing over here. But we said that, you know, we could uh, measure something like a, a VT by uh, saying that this is a VT, or we could also call it a VT star. And we can even bring a model that just is, gives us a piecewise linear thing that is VT star. And look at this piecewise linear thing. It exactly gives us, you know, this um, type of a thing over here. So this is a very simplified uh, view of this type of a graph of VGS versus ID, not in a log scale. And it shows us that we can move the, um, the, the, uh, the characteristic over here, and that's basically moving the VT from being over here, VT1, to being over here, VT0. And that, what that means is that if we have our VDD over here, if we put our word line at VDD, if VT0, you know, if we put on a zero over here and we put VDD over here, we're going to get this uh, nice current. The, uh, we have, uh, you know, that uh, our VWL is going to be, or our VGate is going to be larger than VT and our transistor is going to be on. But if we programmed it over here, we raised the VT really high, then despite putting VDD on our VGate, you know, it's going to be smaller than VT, okay? And therefore, our transistor is still going to be cut off. Um, pay attention that uh, later on we have these multi-level cells. Well, multi-level cells are just putting on more, um, more of these guys over here. And then by putting, you know, different areas over here, we can figure out what kind of state it is, it is at. Um, that's a kind of a thing that we get, or actually maybe measuring the different currents we get at the output. Okay, so um, basically, a uh, um, uh, a flash cell is just by uh, is programmed by changing the VT of the transistor. And many of the resistive cells um, that we discuss later, or maybe that could be called a memristor, um, are basically based on the same principle. Question number nine: Mark the incorrect statement about flash memory. NOR flash has faster reads than NAND flash. Current NAND technology can store as many as 4 bits in one cell. NOR flash can be read or written indefinitely, comparable to DRAM. NAND flash can be 3D stacked with as many as 128 layers. Well, the incorrect statement is going to be this one, that NOR flash can be read or written indefinitely, comparable to DRAM. And let's just remember the differences between NOR and NAND flash to start. So as we saw with the uh, NOR and NAND mask ROM, what happens is that in the NOR flash, the bit line is contacted in each cell versus in the NAND flash, we have a single bit line contact per uh, whole column. And therefore, um, we get a larger cell size for the NAND flash, whereas we get a really small cell size, which can uh, get to 4F squared um, for a NAND flash cell. Um, the result is that we get a fast read for NOR flash because we only have one pull-down transistor 
um, on the on the pull down network versus the NAND flash we have to go through a lot of transistors and therefore we have a high resistivity and the read is slow um, on the other hand NOR flash actually has a faster uh, I mean a slower write than NAND flash um, and, uh, and and because of the cell size really um, NAND flash has become the dominant for most of our things. Um, NOR flash is used for things such as uh, code storage and uh, biases, things that we're going to really read a lot and hardly ever write to them. Um, so the NOR flash uh, market has really um, compacted in the last few years, and there aren't many companies making it, versus NAND flash, which keeps on growing and uh, really fighting off all the other NVM type of uh, replacements that have been lurking around the corner to uh, dethrone it for the last many years. How is it doing that? Well, one thing was uh, actually an invention by a com an Israeli company called Siphon, where they figured out how to not only store one bit in a cell, which is what we usually do have two levels, zero and one, they were able to get a number of bits in a cell, uh, create a multi-level cell. So in one transistor, we could now have two bits or four levels, and that means that our effective size is smaller than four F squares, right? It's four F squared divided by two. Um, since then, we've been able to make, you know, tri uh, ternary level cells, and uh, even quad level cells. So you can really have 16 levels within one cell. I, I must say that this does hurt the reliability, but we put in a lot of information theory, a lot of error correction in order to be able to use these really high density cells and not feel the errors as a, as a user. Okay, um, but that is not enough. The fact that we get in one cell 16 levels or four bits is not um, enough to get the you know amazing uh, terabyte type of USB disk that we have nowadays versus when they started out with maybe kilobytes or, or, or several megabytes. Um, and the, the way that they did it is going from a planar architecture where we just have, you know, one level of uh, cells across a die that we have now um, for many years already, 3D NAND architectures, where we really um, create the, the NAND, NAND cells as these pillars. And currently there are already products out that are 176 layers and and it doesn't look like it's stopping uh, anytime soon. So really, these 3D NAND architectures are very dominant and have enabled us to increase flash density in an amazing way. So when I say that NOR flash has faster read than NAND flash, that is true. The current NAND technology can store as many as four bits in one cell. That's what I showed you over here. Um, and NAND flash can be 3D stacked with as many as 128 layers, even more than that. 176 is a commonly found high-end product um, to date. Um, and again, there are uh, examples of things that are even higher than that. Okay. However, NOR flash can be read or written indefinitely. So one of these uh, big uh, drawbacks of the flash technology is that we are taking electrons and moving them through our, um, our oxide. And that actually damages the oxide. And eventually, it actually leads to breakdown. So um, we cannot actually read neither NOR nor NAND flash indefinitely. They have something like um, the th several thousand um, uh, uh, writes that are able to be done. And therefore, in a controller for flash, Flash, you have this thing called wear leveling, where you really try to spread the writes across the different uh, the different areas of the uh, of the storage, and um, eventually you you defunct um, some of the bits and stop using them. So this is a problem, and this is uh, one of the reasons why flash technology is not considered a DRAM type of a replacement because DRAM needs to be written in red all the time. Question number ten. Which of the following emerging memory technologies is considered magnetic RAM? Would that be PCM, STT, CBRAM, or FERAM? So this is an easy one. It's STT or STT MRAM. So I just want to go quickly over the emerging non-volatile non memory technologies, or at least the leading candidates that we discussed uh, a bit more in depth in the lecture. And you can find a ton of material on different uh, you know, YouTube videos or in, uh, in many different papers. And this has probably changed since I made this video. Um, so we start with PCM, which is, which is phase change memory. Okay, and phase, phase change memory is based on chal chalcogenide uh, um, uh, glass material. It's this material similar to it's used in a CD-ROM. And uh, we have this little mushroom over here, which can be heated up. And depending on how we heat it or cool it down, it changes the resistance of this uh, material over here. So it, it changes the crystalline type of structure, and the resistance can be changed. And a nice thing about phase change memory is that you don't have to heat it up and cool it down in the same way all the time. And 
therefore you can get different resistances and make um, this type of a multi-cell uh, bit. Yeah, you can also uh, potentially stack these one on top of the other and get 3D stacking similar to what you can do with, uh, with uh, uh, Flash. And another thing is, is that it can potentially be embedded as a back end of the line layer in a, in a, on top of a CMOS process. So that's phase change memory. And currently, um, already Intel and Micron have put out, um, you know, products that are pretty commonly found called Optane, um, which uh, you can go out and buy nowadays. Plus, um, many other uh, fabs have been making PCMs in one way or another, even though they're not as widespread. But this is really the most mature candidate, which is already out in the market on uh, on a wide uh, distribution and can be bought today. Um, these things like the multi-level and, uh, and multi-layer, as far as I know, are not really available currently, but possibly that is in the next generations that we'll be able to see if they can get um, through problems such as yield and, and reliability. Okay, um, the, the second type uh, that we see over here is the RAM or resistive RAM. And resistive RAM is uh, several of these families of technologies, um, such as CBRAM, conductive bridge RAM, or OXRAM, uh, oxide filament type of a RAM, which means that we have, you know, two electrodes and we have some sort of a dielectric layer in, in between them. And then either we create or remove a type of a filament. And uh, the, depending on the robustness of the uh, filament over here, either we get a high resistance between the two layers or we get a low resistance and therefore we can differentiate between a one and a zero. Here again, similar to PCM, depend, we can build this filament in different ways and therefore have different levels of uh, resistance and therefore get a multi-level cell. And again, here we can do this in something like a via layer, and therefore we can have potentially 3D stacking, and there are different examples and uh, uh, demonstrations of this. And um, it's been said to be right around the corner for several years now. Um, it's offered already by uh, different foundries, and different companies are making their own uh, RERAMs. And in fact, it's been, been uh, shown to be uh, a good candidate for a type of in-memory computing, um, such as doing dot products, which are very useful in uh, AI-type tasks, uh, neural network solutions and so forth. Okay, um, STT MRAM is the uh, third candidate I want to discuss here, and that's spin transfer torque uh, magnetic RAM. So MRAM was the answer to our Kahoot question. What are the magnetic technologies? And STT is one of those. And um, these MRAM technologies, they work uh, using uh, ferro ferromagnetic materials, which have spin. And so as you can see here, one of the layers, which is called usually the pin layer or the reference layer, has uh, most of, in fact, almost all of their electrons with a certain spin, such as spin up over here. It can also be um, spin to the right or to the left, but in one direction. And then there's another layer, which is called the free layer. And depending on how we drive current through this thing, um, we can change the spin of the electrons in the free layer to either be in the same direction as the pin layer or be in the opposite direction. And that will set a difference between the resistivity of, uh, of this entire device. Um, unfortunately, that is not as easy to make a multi-level such as we saw with PCM and uh, RAM. And um, uh, th that, that's uh, number one. And number two, this is a harder technology to stack as usually most of the options need their own transistor to uh, at least one transistor, sometimes two transistors to control them. But SDT MRAM um, tends to be number one more robust because we're not actually changing the uh, material which you were doing with most of the other technologies. And the other thing is reads tend to be faster. So um, uh, actually the next generation of MRAM, which is SOT MRAM, um, has speeds that are in the order of magnitude of SRAM and therefore really are considered to be a type of an embedded type of uh, uh, low level cache solution. Um, the final one that I wanted to discuss is the ferroelectric RAM, which has gotten gained a lot of popularity in the last couple of years. And instead of ferromagnetic materials, which are used in STTM RAM, it uses ferroelectric materials. And in fact, they, the reason it's become popular is because uh, it was found out that um, materials that they have inside a fab, such as hafnium oxide, are, have this ferroelectric uh, um, this ferroelectric characteristic, and therefore we can make either a MOSFET or a, com uh, or a capacitor out of this uh, ferroelectric material uh, that is found on in fabs, this hafnium oxide, and um, we can change the polarity of the ferroelectric material and therefore create um, a type of a, uh, you know, a, a, of a non-volatile storage cell. So this is another one that has been shown to have potential in the last uh, few years. So, of course, our answer to that is STT MRAM. By the way, CBRAM is conductive bridge RAM, which is a type of RERAM. 
Okay, and our last question for today, which of the following properties is not usually considered an advantage of current emerging memory technologies? Is it that they are high speed, that they are non-volatile, that they have high density, or that they have back end of the line compatibility? And the one that is not as much considered as one of the advantages is the high speed. That's kind of a relative answer and maybe not the greatest one that I could have chosen. But let me remind you that um, the, the biggest advantage over here is that we want to take, you know, and find a replacement for flash, possibly for DRAM. We want to have something that is going to be non-volatile or all of them basically are non-volatile. They are these, uh, most of them are these resistive type of memories that their memristors, they remember the resistance of what we programmed into them. Um, the other thing is that they, to be this type of a, of a, um, of a competitor, they have to have high density. So those are really the two probably most uh, important characteristics. Uh, between the four plus um, uh, technologies that we discussed, there are trade-offs. Not all of them have the same density. Not all of them have the same endurance, for example, that we can write to them uh, an infinite amount of time um, and so forth. Um, the, there are many other types of, uh, of trade-offs that we have here. One of the most important is to have back-end-of-the-line CMOS compatibility, which enables us to make these embedded um, versions of them. So we have embedded MRAM, we have embedded RERAM, uh, embedded PCM, and that means that we can take our silicon, our regular die and then stack on the higher layers and the back-end layers. We can make memories and uh, access them without going through you know, the package and uh, the, the high-capacitance lines and, and limited numbers of lines and so forth. So that's a big bonus also to have. Um, on the other hand, speed, well, I, uh, the reason I wrote it down there is because none of these really um, are considered to have speed that's going to be a challenger to SRAM, for example, or to traditional flip-flops. So speed is, is, is of, a lower, um, uh, uh, of a lower importance. Some of them are even actually a lot slower. So um, if you take something like a hard disk, which really takes millions of cycles to access, a magnet type of hard disk, just going up to a flash cell it gives us a large boost in speed that's why our ssds are much faster than our old types of hard disks and if we can get these types of embedded things we're going to again get probably orders of magnitude better speed but will they get to dram um dram operation speed and the question is the answer is maybe um where they get to sram speed the answer is probably not but if you go to something like sot mram they should be um, not that far away from SRAM and then be able to replace things such as like an L3 or an L4 cache. So the answer to that, of course, was high speed. All the others, non-volatility, high density, and back end line compatibility are considered advantages of these technologies. So that was it for this lecture. And um, that is the last Kahoot I'm going to be giving in this course for now. So um, I'm signing off over here and you're welcome to ask me questions on my YouTube channel. Goodbye.